Okay, hopefully that's recording. If not, we'll get over it. Um, <clears throat> can, I, can I sing a song? Sure. <clears throat> I'm going to sing three, if that's all right. But I'm going to put them all into one. And you'll know them all, I guarantee you. Because they're in your hymn book. So you, you know all the songs in the hymn book, don't you? You wouldn't say that. Faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon fire and sword. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear that glorious word. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to thee till death. Faith of our fathers, we will love both friend and foe in all our strife and preach thee to as love knows how by kindly words and virtuous life faith of our fathers holy faith we will be true to thee till death encamped along the hills of light ye christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies against the foe in veils below let all our strength be hurled faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world his banner over us is love our sword the word of god we tread the road the saints above with shouts of triumph trod by faith they like a whirlwind's breath swept on o'er every field the faith by which they conquered death is still a shining shield. On every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head with truth all gird about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. The fight is on, the trumpet sound is ringing out, the cry to arms is heard afar and near, the Lord of hosts is marching on to victory, the triumph of the Christ will soon appear. The fight is on, no Christian soldiers, and face to face in stern array. With armor gleaming and colors streaming, the right and wrong engage today. The fight is on, but be not weary. Be strong and in his might hold fast. If God be for us, his banner o'er us, we'll sing the victor's song at last. And yet, Amen. all those are true, right? Amen. Amen. And yet, that doesn't seem to be the way we act today, is it? We seem to feel like, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we seem to, I don't know, I say this over and over, and, and I feel like today that I'm kind of like the kid with the, with the five biscuits and the two sardines, right? A few loaves, those loaves are little bitty things, so about like cat and biscuits and two little fish, and God fed 5,000 people. And I don't know I'm going to feed 5,000 people, but I'm just kind of spreading my five loaves and two fishes, my five biscuits and two sardines all around. It, it may not seem like much, but I think what I have is an encouragement to you, or could be an encouragement to you, that just because things are bad doesn't mean God's through with us. It doesn't mean, I understand that the 
the Bible says times will wax worse and worse. And But, I mean, let's think about this for a second now. Now, we think it can't get any worse, right? I mean, we sit inside the walls of our churches and the walls of our homes, and we complain about the world. But, you know, if you back up 50 or 60 years, people were convinced God was coming back in, in the 70s. Uh, if you go back before that, you go back to the 1920s, people didn't think it could get I mean, the, the, this convention was going bad, and that convention was going bad, and, and people were starting new movements, and, and yet they felt like God had to be coming back because it just can't get any worse, and yet there was a revival. I mean, a revival such that during World War II, uh, one of the crassest generals in World War II, General Patton, uh, once asked for a during the Battle of the Bulge, or right before, what, during the, what, the incident we call the Battle of the Bulge, you know, the weather was bad. They couldn't see to send the planes over to see what was going on. And, and he looked to a junior officer there and he said, we need a chaplain. We need somebody to pray for this weather to break. And he said, uh, go find me a chaplain. So the young officer goes and, and the chaplain has set up in a local church building there in town and he said, the general wants you to come up here to headquarters and, and pray for the weather to break. And the chaplain said, I'm not going up there. Y'all been drinking whiskey and smoking them cigars and telling those dirty jokes. If he wants to pray, he can come down here where everybody else comes when they want to pray. You don't understand, General Patton said he wants you to come pray. You don't understand, I'm not going up there. I'll see you court martial. Be that as it may, I'll be right here. He goes back, the junior officer goes back and tells Patton, and much to his dismay, Patton says, that's the preacher I'm looking for. <laughs> and he went down there, and Patton got on his face before God and said something to the effect of, dear father, I can't help but feel I have somehow offended you. If you'll forgive me and give me good weather, I'll give you Germany to celebrate your son's birthday. God gave the weather, and Patton gave him Germany. You know, we didn't think it could get any worse. But God sent a revival. You go back just before the Civil War. People didn't think it could get any worse. Man named D.L. Moody, man named D.L. Moody saved in the 1850s. In the 1850s, just after D.L. Moody was saved, a struggling church in New York City hires a, a retired salesman that was a Christian to come in and knock on doors and invite people to church. And he wasn't seeing anything happening from knocking on those doors. And he said, we need to pray. So he started a lunchtime prayer meeting. This man's name was Jeremiah Lanfear. And he started a lunchtime prayer meeting. And the first lunch, I think one or two other people showed up just before the lunch hour was over. But he stayed after it. And within a short amount of time, this is hard for me to believe, but 10,000 businessmen closed their shops for an hour every day to pray. Amazing, right? And that turned into a revival. You back up before that. You know, let's go back 50 years, 1799. A man named Timothy Dwight is, is the, 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 the president of Yale University. Y'all probably know this already, but Yale and Harvard and Brown, all these were started as preachers' colleges. Uh, yet Harvard will tell you today that they're their motto is veritas or truth, but their original motto was veritas pro Christus et ecclesia, truth for Christ and his church. Okay, uh, Yale's was something like uh, light, light and something else, but it had a picture of the Bible on it. Okay, so Timothy Dwight, it's, it's basically a preacher's college, and Timothy Dwight says he realizes. It's the majority of the student body no longer believes the Bible. 
So rather than what we do today, right, is we just talk about these stinking millennials and these stinking post-millennials, I call them. I think Generation Z is the official name. Rather than just sitting back and complaining about them, he engaged them. He preached to say, you haven't got to defend this thing. You just got to let it loose, right? He preached it. And a revival started that carried us through the War of 1812. You back up 50 years before that. And, and, and Jonathan Edwards realizes that the majority of the church is lost. Well, why? Well, his grandpa, trying to keep people out of jail, I reckon, came up with the halfway covenant. You see, it's, it's by law. You had to be a part of the church up there in, in New England. So Mr. Stoddard came up with this plan. Of, you can join the church if mom and daddy's members of the church. You don't have to have your own profession of faith. I want to say he's just trying to keep people out of jail. I don't know what he was thinking. He clearly wasn't thinking biblically, right? But uh, the time his grandson's pastor... Half the flock is lost, maybe more than half the flock. And he started preaching. And he wasn't a very dramatic preacher. He just kind of read. No hand motions. Not a lot of voice inflection. At the same time, a man named George Whitfield came along. He's called the Forgotten Foundling Father. By the way, neither one of these fellows was Baptist. No, on it. All right. <clears throat> but they... Uh, uh, one preached one way, one preached another way, one preached in one town, one goes all up and down the coast. Uh, Whitfield's the first person to refer to this as uh, the great American nation. But my point is, people didn't think it could get any worse. And a revival took place. You go back to Bunyan's day, 100 years before. I mean, how often is it? And now, now you got some crazy people out here today saying that we came from, we Baptists came from the Reformation. But I've read John T. Christian's History of the Baptists. It's a two volume series there on the history of the Baptists. And he says in the Dark Ages, a man, a Baptist man, could leave Italy and walk to Denmark and stay with a Baptist every night. You say, oh, that's Baptist. He's, he's exaggerating. We are known for that. Okay. So a Catholic man said in the 1500s that if being willing to suffer persecution and die for your faith was proof as to who had the apostles' doctrine, it can be none other than the Anabaptists, for they have died more numerously and more joyfully than all other sects combined. My point is all throughout history, we've come to these times where we feel like things can't get any worse. But what does the Bible say? We're going to, I promise we're going to read a verse here in Matthew chapter 5 in just a second. But what does the Bible say about drawing near to God, right? If we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. And so I, I'm not looking for some hooky, spooky something to happen. I'm looking for God's people to draw near to God, and he will then use us to reach the community. A revival is not a series of meetings. A revival is where God's people get thoroughly right with God, and then they figure out a way to reach the lost around them. A, a phrase I learned in the Marine Corps, adapt, improvise, and overcome. Things that we've done, if you do, th th they say this. If you do the same thing, the same way, and expect a different result, that is the definition of insanity, right? And so the Word of God hasn't changed. The Scriptures have not changed. The Savior has not changed. Whether we want to realize it or not, the sinners around us have not changed. We've got to figure out how God can use us to reach them. In Matthew chapter 13, the Bible says, Ye are the salt of the earth. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, pardon me. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the lost salt hath lost it, his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. I think if you looked at the news today, you would see the average church is being trodden underfoot of men. The average Christian has been trodden under foot of men. And I think it's because we've lost our savor. We are, i got to start out on bad in order to get to the good, right? 
we are failing at the Great Commission both. Have you ever paid attention to that word both? Both in Jerusalem and Judea and the uttermost part of the earth, right? All right, I'm just, I'm just talking to you. Do you know what the average response is when I contact the church about missions? Anybody want to guess? The average response is no response whatsoever. Do you know what my second average response is? We can't do it. The most troubling response is when I don't, I don't, I have a number, I have an address, I have all this information, and I pull it up on the internet and it says permanently closed. But yet Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail. I think the problem is, you know, I, I love those songs, those military type Christian songs there, and, and I hate those songs like Hold the Fort because there's nothing in this book that says we're supposed to hold the fort. I hope that's not your favorite song. You sang this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I still hate it, amen. Because we're not supposed to be in this fort, amen. We're supposed to be on attack. The Bible says in Romans 8, 37, that we are more than conquerors in Christ. Okay, so I'm one of those weirdos that likes languages. I teach English. I teach French. I can speak a tiny bit of Spanish. I can preach in French. I can preach in Icelandic. I can read any Germanic language. I can read 60, 70% of any Latin language. I like languages. Those words, you know, you, youngest one in the house, you know one of those words. That word, conqueror, you probably have at least at one point in your life had a shoe with that Greek word on the back of it. It's got a little swoop on the side of it. What shoe has a little swoop on the side of it? Nike. Nike. That's exactly right. That word conqueror is Nike, or we say Nike. More than is hyper. We are hyper Nike. We are more than conquerors in Christ, and yet we're hiding up in here trying to hold the floor. We're supposed to be more than conquerors. Y'all would not argue with the Great Commission. I know you would. If I were to ask you to quote the Great Commission, most of you would start with, go ye therefore. But if you read the recordings of the Great Commission, like in Matthew, it starts in the verse before. And he starts on this, this foundation. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That word power is the same word used in Romans 13. I'm not going to bore you with me trying to pronounce that one, okay? But it's the same word used in Romans 13 to talk about the government. So it's his authority. It's his jurisdiction. So I can go out here and I can talk to anybody about the Lord. And I can still be kind to them because if they reject what I have to say... It's kind of like what God told Samuel, right? When the, when the children of Israel wanted a king, Samuel was kind of pouting. What did God tell Samuel? They didn't reject you, son. They rejected me. Amen. So it's his authority. It's his jurisdiction. If you look in, in John, he says, uh, As the Father sent me, so send I you. Now, y'all look like some fine Christian folks, but I'm just not thinking that y'all can take five biscuits and two sardines and feed the town of Teague, okay? I'm not thinking you can walk on water. I'm not thinking you can say to the storm, peace be still. When I was in the, the uh, Iglesia Bautista La Foi, La Fe, over here, the Faith Baptist Church that speaks Spanish, right? Uh, this morning there were three visitors who came from Florida trying to get away from Dorian, all right? So we he, he's not talking about we have that same power that he has to rebuke a storm and all of that. But... <clears throat> I could be wrong. I wouldn't argue with you if, if you say I'm wrong. But I believe he's talking about his love. When I, when I look at people that won't work, that just makes me mad. I could introduce you to 25 people on disability that are in better health than I am, and, and I've never taken disability. 
You know, it, it bothers me when people won't work. If you got a physical limitation, okay. But, I mean, there's just some lazy people out there. It bothers me. I get mad when I look at the drunkards and the drug addicts who are abusing their children or neglecting their children. I get mad when I look at the sexual perversion in our world. But how did Jesus look at them? As sheep having no shepherd. Having raised sheep, maybe somebody else in the room has, but I've raised sheep and they are stupid, okay? That sheep could be dying of starvation and if that sheep, here's the point that I wanna to make to you, if that sheep is not accustomed to your presence, you can't feed it. You might dump it down and run away from it, but it is not going to eat it from your hand. I, on the contrary, if it's accustomed to your presence, it'll come up and take anything you wanna give it. They're stupid. But they do know this, if I don't know you, I'm not eating anything out of your hand. I think he's talking about his love. He was moved with compassion because he saw them as sheep having no shepherd. And in Acts, it talks about, you shall receive power. And that is actually talking about strength. That word there, power there, is the same word translated power in Mark 1. Now, I know Brother Kimball has probably told you that that's the word as dunamis. It's where we get our English word dynamite. So it's his explosive power. I can't change anybody's life. D.L. Moody once bumped into a drunkard on the street and, and was trying to tell a man how to be saved. The man said, you know me, you saved me. You look like somebody I'd save, said D.L. Moody. You need the Lord to save you. We can't ha do it. We have nothing for them. But he has dynamite to change their lives. Then, how did, what, what prefaced all of that? Everybody wants the power from Acts chapter 2, right? Everybody wants to go out in the street and preach and see 3,000 people saved. If you read Acts 1.14, they continued in one accord and prayer for 10 days. What does the word Pentecost mean? 50. It says 50 days from Passover. Jesus ascended 40 days from Passover. So they spent approximately 10 days praying. Now, a lot of people think they got the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2. Well, if Jesus gave you something, do you have possession of it? Okay? So in John 20, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. They didn't get the Holy Ghost in Acts 2. The Holy Ghost got all of them. You understand? Our lives are full of muck and madness. And when the Holy Spirit fills us up, the muck and madness can flow out to the side. And then we can overflow that spirit. The proof of being uh, filled with the Spirit, in, in my humble but right estimation, is not talking in tongues. Though I can speak, I had a fun time in Africa teasing the, the charismatics because they had to go to language school three years and I preached in French in six weeks. But <clears throat> the proof is that the entire church was outside telling people about Jesus. Speaking, the Bible says in Acts, the wonderful works of God. All right? So the preface to the Great Commission is prayer. I don't answer. But how often do we pray for God to let us win somebody to Christ? I, I, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read them all, but I have written here six, and I did not exhaust them, references that say anything we ask, he'll give it to us. The, I only have one reference that puts kind of a bridle on that, anything you ask, and that is from, there may be another one, but the only one I could think of this afternoon was the reference that gives us what we often call the Lord's Prayer. We should probably call it the model prayer, but he says, thy will be done. So in other words, we have to ask it according to his will. So 2 Peter 3, 9 says, He's not willing that any should perish at all, should, but that all should come to repentance. So if we pray for God to let us lead people to Christ, don't you think he'd honor that? Matthew chapter 11, Jesus quotes 
what the, the Pharisees have said about him, and they accused him of things that weren't true. But in the middle of that, there's this true statement. It says they accused him of being gluttonous, which means eating too much, wine bibber, which means he was a drunkard. We know those two are not true. But in the middle of that, they said he was a friend of publicans and sinners. That is true. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. In John 15, he called us his friends if we do what he says. He called us his friends if we keep his commandments. So don't answer out loud. But how many sinners are you friends with? Now, we've got scripture for not being friends with sinners, right? The scripture says in in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, come out from among... I'm sorry. It's 1 first, first Corinthians... No, I'm right. It's 1 Corinthians chapter... 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. But you know, what is said before that? Well, if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there's sin in the church. I mean awful sin in the church. Sin that shouldn't be named among the Gentiles, Paul writes. Sin, a man is having a relationship with his stepmom. And nobody in the church is saying anything about it. And Paul said, I wrote unto you not to keep company with, and there's a list of sinners there. But then he says, not all together, because then you'd have to leave the world. You'd have to go to heaven. If you're not going to keep company with, not going to talk to a fornicator, not going to talk to an adulterer, not going to talk to a drunkard, you got to go to heaven because they're here. But if any man that's called a brother. So I think that's who Christ is saying. Sure, I shouldn't go out. Well, I'm married, so I'm not going to worry about marrying anybody. You understand, a single person that's a Christian shouldn't go out and marry a lost person. Okay? i got to take it a step further than that. If you're Baptist, you ought to marry Baptist because other denominations don't, don't do things, and it's going to lead to conflict. But clearly, lost people and saved people shouldn't join together in any sort of a covenant. All right? But he's not saying that we shouldn't be their friends. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that he was going to be all things to all people that by all means he might win some. He didn't say he's going to win all. I'd feel like a loser, amen. But he said win some. Are you a friend of sinners? Look, I'm not talking about, I just need to, I know I'm in an independent Baptist church. But just for clarity, I'm not talking about going down to the bar. I, I recently heard a preacher say, he uses this phraseology a lot when he's preaching. He said, if you don't know, you don't know. He says that a lot. And when he first got saved, he, he'd never been to church. The only reason he went to church, Brother Heil, is his senior year of high school, this real pretty blonde started riding the bus. And he asked her out. And she said, I, I can't go out with you, but you can come to church with me. Her daddy was planting a church in town. And, uh, boy, you should hear him talk about it. It was crazy. He talked about when he's sitting there, all the women had songbooks on their head like so. And he's like, I'm thinking, what is, what? finally he asked her, and he said, the, she said the, there were bats in the building, and if the bats flew out, they'd get tied up in their hair. So they had, I mean, it was rough, all right? But <clears throat> a year or so after he came when he was in college, he, he actually got saved. And so he invited a bunch of, he, he knew this, he knew he was lost and he had gotten saved and he knew his friends needed to be saved too. So he raised his hand on Wednesday night and asked for prayer. I got a lot of lost people coming to see me baptized Sunday. I had to promise to go down to the tavern and buy him a beer after church. You know, I mean, you know, if you don't know, you don't know. The preacher loved him and helped him through such silliness as that. But when I say be friend to sinners, I mean, I think you all know I'm not talking about taking them to the bar, all right? But just being friends. I've got a few examples here I'm going to run through, and I promise I'm coming in for a landing. I just want to encourage you and you and you and you and whoever you are. If you're breathing, God can still use you to do something for him, all right? I got a friend in Gulfport named Ron Porter. And uh, 
he used to be an evangelist and he's not he's still doing evangelistic work but he's not going out and preaching meetings like he used to Ron's talent is is twofold he can turn wrenches and he's one of the best auto painters I've ever seen you know the, the, you can go to AutoZone and buy a roll of, of stripes so you can strike your car right no 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 Ron does it by hand beautiful all right so a couple of nights I don't know if it's every week but I know for this particular Friday and Saturday he spent four hours each night with 15 people approximately half of whom were lost approximately half of whom profess to be saved but are clearly not where they need to be and just spending that time with them they're fixing up an old car and you take Friday night a lost man a man he knows is lost said I'm gonna give some money to your church in front of everybody Ron said God doesn't want your money he wants you you understand and so he's just finding something in common that they can do together and for them it's working on old cars but he's being able to see people saved and see the church grow by turning wrenches. Hmm. I was telling the preacher last night that the crazy guy was talking about the books on the women's head when he went to church. He talked about seeing a church grow that had, and he asked the pastor why it was growing and he pointed to two older women sitting over here and he said, well, that's the orange shirt crew. As if the preacher's supposed to know what that meant. So he said, well, you know, what is that? There's two old ladies that went down to the local elementary school and volunteered to be lunchroom monitored, and they wore uh, orange shirts that said, are you ready? This is, this is earth-shattering, lunchroom monitor, okay? And they just spent every day, a couple hours every day, in the lunchroom monitoring the little kids and building relationships with them and then winning their parents to Christ and bringing them to church. I... I St. God told the story of a, a, a wealthy man's wife who didn't need for anything, who went and learned how to drive a school bus so that she could meet kids in the area. And the next time they had, the year after she drove the bus for a year, and then they had BBS, and she brought 37 kids to church that she met on a bus route. I know one guy, big fat redneck from Mississippi, uh, who went down every Sunday morning to a local Mexican restaurant and taught simple English lessons and preached the gospel and saw people saved. Um, and I know of a lady who is crippled. She can't go out door to door. She can't do what we would typically call evangelism. But she ran an ad in the paper, learned to crochet Thursdays 5 to 7 won people to Christ, brought them to church. I know of a fellow that was in college who liked to play ping pong and started a ping pong group at the local YMCA. And after a couple of weeks, he started giving them tracts and asking them to stay for a Bible study and winning them to Christ. You know, the, the, I know people who, who go and mow somebody's lawn, mow a drunkard's lawn for him and, and just keep mowing his lawn for him when it needs cutting until he'll sit down and listen to the gospel. I mean, the, the ideas are, are endless. Um, feed a football team, feed a band. You know, those kids, have, they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty tight on time between school gets out at three o'clock and they have to be at a football game. And I don't know if they'll let you do it in Texas, but in Mississippi, churches feed those kids. It's not hard. A church of this size fed band and football at our local school. My wife and I bought some hams cheaper. Did you know ham? I don't know if it is in Texas, but in Mississippi, hams are cheaper than hamburger. So we bought some hams on sale. My wife baked them. This lady brought macaroni and cheese. This lady brought cake. And this lady bought green beans. And we fed the football team. Adapt, improvise, and overcome. Are you... We ain't talking about him. We're talking about the church. Are you a friend of sinners? I'm of the opinion, and this one I won't let you correct me on. If we're still here, God still wants to reach people. What are you doing? Y'all going to expect me, whether you support me or not, you expect me to go to Germany, start a church, and win people to Christ. 
God's question is, what are you doing in T? Because there's lost people in T, Texas. There are lost people in, what's the next town over Fairfield? That He can use you. Did you know, I said I was going to shut up and I promise I'm fixing to. Tell me your name, brother. Jack Ward. Jack Ward. Ward. Did you know, Brother Jack, there are people that you know that would never talk to Brother Timothy because he's a preacher. You're not, they don't trust the preachers. There are people that you know. I know you told me your name, I've forgotten, but there are people that you know that would never talk to the preacher's wife, but they talk to you. I don't, if you're breathing, you know somebody that you can witness to. You know, I just heard. I'll tell you this, and then I promise I'm going to shut up. I'm coming out the pulpit and turn it over to you, all right? Of a group of senior citizens who moved into an assisted living center <coughs> to start a church to reach other senior citizens. The Great Commission is to the church. God wants to reach sinners. We've got to be their friends if we're going to reach them because they're sheep. And if they're not accustomed to our presence, even though we have eternal life in our hand to give to them, they're not going to take it. We've got to adapt, improvise, and overcome. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the privilege of preaching here tonight. I pray that it was an encouragement to pastor and people alike. Lord, we love you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.